next session on thyroid disorders and i like to invite dr aisha ahmed who is uh, associate professor in the department of pediatrics uh, amu jail uh, jail and medical college uh, aligarh muslim university good afternoon everyone thank you dr anurag for uh, giving me this opportunity so i welcome you all to this thyroid module so before we proceed to the case based uh, discussion as it was said uh, i would like to uh, just give a brief uh, Uh, recap of what normal thyroid functions and how to interpret uh, a thyroid function test so as you all know thyroid gland is a butterfly shaped gland which is situated in the neck and it produces a thyroid uh, hormone thyroxine which is the most important hormone and it is under control by tsh from the uh, pituitary which in turn is under uh, control from trs secreted from the hypothalamus so the important point uh, here is that uh, tsh is a glycoprotein hormone and it shares uh, alpha subunit with many other uh, hormones like lh fsh and scg so the important uh, point to remember is uh, in cases where there is excessive secretion of one of these hormones like tsh in cases of hypothyroidism so because of hormone overlap there can be stimulation of other hormones as well so the clinical implication here is in cases where there is excessive tsh there can be stimulation of lh fsh receptors as well which can lead to a varied manifestation of hypothyroidism like uh, precocious puberty like ovarian cyst so these points should always be kept in mind so the major hormones uh, that we measure while evaluating children with thyroid dysfunctions are thyroid hormone thyroxine levels as well as the stimulatory hormone that is tsh which is very very easily available in the laboratories and uh, how to label a thyroid dysfunction is just a interplay between what are the levels of these hormones so in cases of uh, as you can see in the slide here in cases of low free t uh, Uh, four levels always think of hypo functioning thyroid that is hypothyroidism the next step is go uh, to go for tsh levels so if the tsh levels are high that indicates primary because tsh levels obviously rise because of low thyroid hormones so this is primary hypothyroidism whereas if the levels are low or uh, inappropriately normal for that uh, low t4 levels that could uh, the causes could be central hypothyroidism so likewise if the free t4 levels are high think of uh, hyper functioning thyroid and again then next uh, step is to go to for uh, tsh estimation if the tsh levels are low so think of uh, thyrotoxicosis so this is how we great thyroid function so uh, what are the conditions when do you order thyroid function test so it should be uh, ordered whenever you see children who have got either typical manifestations where you suspect hypothyroidism as a reason or the manifestations may be varied and atypical as well as i said like in cases of precocity like in, like in cases of cardiomyopathy and explained cardiomyopathy like in cases of uh, pseudo uh, paralysis of muscles on those there are certain like in ovarian cysts in precocious, uh, precocious puberty so you should think of thyroid and uh, order thyroid function test in such a scenario then who are the children then there is a, there is a subset of population uh, of children who are more predisposed to get thyroid dysfunctions like in uh, children who have got other autoimmune disorders uh, like celiac disease like uh, type 1 diabetes and in certain chromosomal disorders like in cases of down syndrome so in these are the children you should suspect that the probability of having a hyperfunctioning thyroid or thyroid disorders is more as compared to the general population so you subject you should subject them for, to uh, regular screening and uh, most importantly every newborn now this is the uniform uh, universal recommendation that every newborn should be sub, uh, subjected to a neonatal screening for congenital hypothyroidism uh, as this thyroid dysfunction uh, most of the time is permanent so it requires a lifelong treatment so there should be no negative reinforcement a definite a proper counseling is very important they have to stick to the medication because it's a lifelong disorder and you should be aware about the physiological variance so that means you need not uh, you should not treat the reports the biochemical parameters but the patient per se so detailed history and examination is very important uh, there can be physiological normal variance where the reports can be abnormal the child is absolutely euthyroid and has no problems so these points should always be kept in mind before embarking upon uh, any treatment then um, as far as basal levels are concerned the thyroid hormone levels they change they have high levels uh, that depends upon age so age of uh, the child is very important before commenting upon any uh, thyroid dysfunction and the uh, smaller the children they have got higher uh, basal values of thyroid hormones 
then there is limited role of dynamic test like in many endocrine disorders you as, as we have talked about growth hormone you go for a stimulation test so there is limited role of dynamic test for the static test uh, would do fine in uh, evaluating thyroid and there is no clinical effect of timing now uh, though like uh, all other with all other endocrine hormones there is diurnal variation with tsh and thyroid hormones as well but there is no clinical with the advent of more advanced laboratory parameters and the methods of estimation that we have now uh, so there is no need for uh, going for a particular time for evaluation for uh, thyroid dysfunction now a bit about hypothalamic pituitary thyroid axis so what happens actually from the hypothalamus it's a corticotropin uh, releasing hormone which uh, stimulates the anterior pituitary which acts on the receptor and stimulates the anterior pituitary to stimulate uh, Uh, the production of tsh now what this tsh does it stimulates the thyroid gland it acts on the tsh receptors which are present on a thyroid gland and it stimulates the production of thyro thyroxine that is t4 which is the uh, which you can say is a pre hormone so which is the most common form which is the most predominant form which is secreted from the thyroid but it's not the physiologically active one so it's a pro hormone it's like a pro hormone which needs to be converted into t3 uh, so t3 this t3 is the more uh, biologically active uh, form of the thyroid hormone which gets uh, converted uh, from t4 in the peripheral tissues by deiodinase and a, a small popular percent is converted into reverse t3 which is an inert uh, substance so this is how thyroid hormone is degraded no most of the thyroid in the uh, circulation is circulated bound to carrier proteins like with other uh, hormones out of which this tbg thyro uh, thyroglobulin binding globulin is the most predominant others are uh, transthyretin and free albumin so uh, most of the about 95 96% of uh, thyroid hormones they are present in the circulation in the bound form with tbg most uh, commonly with uh, tbg and a small proportion about roughly 0.02 to 0.03% is available as free now these free hormone levels are because they are free available for uh, to exert their action so this is again the more uh, physiological uh, uh, form of hormone which is available uh, for the actions of the thyroid that we see in uh, different organs now uh, what happens actually in cases of like if there is a hypofunctioning of a thyroid gland so what happens now uh, suppose you are given a option out of the ma major parameters like tsh and the thyroid hormones that we, uh, we can easily uh, measure in the laboratory so if you are given an option which is the best if you are given an option so it's always the tsh the reason being it's the most sensitive indicator and it's the first uh, parameter to become abnormal whenever there is uh, any dysfunction in thyroid gland so what happens and a small change in t4 levels leads to logarithmic exponential rise or fall in tsh levels so there is a inverse relationship when the levels of t4 go down the level of tsh as a compensatory because of the loss of negative feedback mechanism the levels of tsh become high and it's a logarithmic rise or fall so it leads to estimation in the circulation much more uh, before the levels of t4 go down so what happens first uh, whenever there is hypofunctioning thyroid so tsh levels are the first to uh, become elevated in the circulation followed by levels of t4 which can be detected after uh, you have changes in the tsh and as far as this uh, though this is the active as i said the biologically active form of thyroid hormone levels of t3 estimation because as i said t3 uh, gets the t4 gets converted into t3 before its action to take place so the level of t3 are maintained for a quite long period of time so what happens t3 is not a very good indicator for maintaining for uh, monitoring a hypofunctioning thyroid because uh, level of t3 can be maintained it gets converted from t4 to t3 and so you can have a normal t3 levels for quite a prolonged period of time so it it can be it can lead to false negative interpretation of the result so t3 is not of value so in a hypofunctioning uh, thyroid or hypothyroidism so the parameters which are helpful are uh, tsh and t4 estimation likewise on the contrary if the there is hyperfunctioning thyroid in thyrotoxicosis what, hap uh, what happens for the same reasons the tsh levels as a compensatory mechanism because the levels of t4 hormones go high because of thyrotoxicosis so because of negative feedback the levels of tsh go down so what happens the first is the tsh the levels they'll be low in the circulation once you measure them the levels of t4 would be high 
and the level of T3 will also remain high because it gets converted into T3, so level of T3. So the role of T3 is in hyperthyroidism, is in thyrotoxicosis, where, whereas it has got no role in uh, hypofunctioning thyroid uh, disorders. So in thyrotoxicosis, uh, you order investigation both uh, T4 and T3 and TSH levels for evaluating. So what is the relationship between TSH and T4? So uh, as the common sense says, it's an inverse relationship between T4 levels and uh, TSH. And as I said, keep it, uh, small changes in T4 causes uh, very exponential changes in the TSH in the opposite direction. So what happens if the levels of T4 thyroid hormones are low and you have TSH, the levels are high. So think of hyperthyroidism as the cause. In, if the situation is that you have uh, TSH levels are also low or normal, like when you have uh, T4 levels which are low, so you expect TSH to rise as a compensation. But if the situation is that the TSH levels are either low or inappropriately normal, so always think there is some problem at the TSH secretion level, that is a pituitary, so or, or hypothalamus for that matter. So always think of central hypothyroidism as the cause uh, for this hypofunctioning thyroid. On the opposite extreme, if the levels of thyroid hormones are high and the TSH levels are low. So what do you suspect here? That is hyperfunctioning, hyperthyroidism, thyrotoxicosis. But in, if the situation is that the TSH is high, like in free T4 levels are high and the TSH should be suppressed, you think of primary hyperthyroidism. But in, if the situation is that the TSH levels are high, so maybe the free T4 levels are high because of increase in the TSH. So always think if the levels are high or normal, so T always think it could be because of TSH adenoma, but that's a very, very rare entity in a pediatric age group. So it's usually the hyperthyroidism because of thyrotoxicosis. Then a um, few words about uh, TSH, about the timing. As I said, like uh, many other hormones, like almost all the endocrine uh, evaluation, we order uh, fasting state hormones. So ideally, uh, even TSH uh, shows diurnal variation and uh, the circadian rhythm. So the levels are uh, uh, maximum during the late night, 11 p.m. to 2 a.m. And the nadir is at uh, 3 to 4 p.m. by the afternoon. But it's not so, uh, uh, not so severe. The pulse, the amplitude, the difference is not so significant to cause any clinical implications. And uh, with the advent of the fourth generation, uh, the advanced assays of uh, measuring uh, TSH in the serum, so this does not make much of a difference. So you can order it. Ideally, it should be done in the early morning fast exit, but it can be done during any time of the day. The range, it depends upon, now. Uh, as far as the range, it depends, it varies from uh, lab to lab and also depends upon the method of estimation, how you have estimated TSH. So it always, you should always look for the laboratory ranges. And another very, very important point here is you have to look for the age because the cutoff of TSH vary depending upon age. So before embarking upon any treatment, before making any uh, conclusion about the normalcy or abnormalcy of reports, always look for the age and the laboratory uh, normal range that they have. The limitation about TSH is they few studies they have said uh, they have found out that it, like uh, it has pulsatile secretion like many other uh, hormones it has pulsatile secretion it might affect sometimes fluctuations depending upon the time when you have uh, measured uh, estimated this TSH levels in the serum. Now very important point is what are the postnatal changes as I said the levels of TSH are not static across all the age groups. So age of estimation, age at which it has been ordered is very important to be pondered upon. So what happens actually whenever a baby is born, so whenever a baby is exposed to the stress of the delivery and exposed to the cold environment, extra so what happens, there is a physiological rise in TSH. So which happens uh, after 30 minutes of birth. So there is a rise in TSH, which is uh, maximum. This rise is maximum seen at uh, 24 hours of life. Then gradually the levels come down within 72 hours and gradually over a, in a week's time it becomes uh, back to normal. So this TSH surge is seen in uh, both term babies as well as preterms, albeit at a, a slower intensity. So it's the response is again, even in preterm babies, the response is they do have a postnatal surge, but it's of a milder uh, severity. So uh, what are the implications? Why is it important to know about this? Because in terms when you have to screen a newborn for uh, genital hypothyroidism, so either sample should be drawn from cord. 
cord blood because this is before the tss otherwise if you draw the sample somewhere here so definitely you're bound to have false positive and you can falsely label the baby as uh, hypothyroidism based on because we are following a tss based method so either it should be taken from the cord blood before this post uh, natal surge uh, happens or you should take after 72 hours of life after the levels they become normal they come back to normal uh in certain scenario there might be a case that it's, it's not possible to keep the baby for 72 hours and uh, the baby has to be discharged before that then you can uh, go for the test even at uh, those uh, uh, age but the higher cut offs are so it's not the cut offs are not the same so preferably you can you do it after 72 hours when you can uh, use the normal values and if it not possible go for uh, you can uh, check even within 24 to 48 hours but the cut offs are uh, different and high as compared to the rest of the population so uh, how do tsh levels vary across uh, different age groups as you can see Uh, the smaller the baby the higher the cut off values are it's uh, 20 like 20 million international unit in the first week of life and gradually as the baby grows older the levels they come down and at the point of action that means uh, you have to start treatment and underlying etiology simultaneously you have to work along that lines as well but the levels they go on decreasing as the age advances then action what do you do once you do a neonatal so this just a brief uh, recapitulation of a neonatal assessment so you order tsh as we do it from the cord blood or we do it from uh, the dps right blood spot so the tsh levels if its levels are more than 40 you have to start the treatment right then and there you don't have to wait for the investigation the investigation they will take time you just order the investigation go for them but the treatment is warranted if the levels are less than 20 uh this is beyond uh, 72 hours of age if the child is less than uh, that uh, age then you have to go for higher cut off levels this is uh, which is uh, more than 34 so in a baby who is uh, less than 72 hours levels more than 34 and baby who is above 20 uh, above 3 uh, days of life levels more than 20 uh, less than 20 you don't have to treat and above that definitely you have to assess accordingly if the levels are borderline between 20 to 40 above 40 you have to start the treatment less than 20 treatment is not required but if the results are in between 20 this is the most of the uh, common situation that we frequently encounter what what to do when you encounter a baby who has got levels uh, between 20 to 40 so it has to be repeated because there are certain conditions like the baby is sick and in certain scenarios like in preterm babies there can be a uh, transient elevation of cs uh, tsh so you wait you give two weeks for this transient elevation to settle down so you repeat the sample after two weeks so after two weeks of life the easiest way uh, for you to remember is just remember two weeks cut off so in children according to the international and also the national spay guidelines that we have if the children in babies who are less than two weeks of age if the level is more than 20 and in children babies who are more than two weeks of age level more than 10 is taken as a normal so this two weeks less than two weeks more than two weeks and level less than uh, 20 uh, uh, more than 20 and more than 10 is taken as a normal okay so this is the easy way to remember if the levels in a baby who is 2 weeks and beyond levels more than 10 is taken as abnormal and needs to be evaluated further accordingly so this was about the neonatal physiology so what happens during childhood you again order tsh in a, a child who is uh, suspected of having any disorders of uh, if the levels are more than 10 so in a childhood uh, during childhood levels of more than are taken as abnormal so if the levels are more than 10 you straight away uh, start the treatment and uh, simultaneously you look for what are the causes of uh, hypothyroidism but the treatment has to be started in such a scenario if the level is less than 6 it is taken as abnormal if the levels are again borderline again this is the most uh, dilemmatic situation what to do when the levels are uh, somewhat in between border 6 to 10 million international units so what do you do you order then uh, for a free you look at t4 levels what free t4 levels are if the t4 levels are low treatment has to be started if the t4 levels are normal then definitely you have to reassure and monitor the child for the symptoms and for growth monitoring and look for other pointers of thyroid disorders in the child per se if the levels of the situation is that the levels of free t4 are normal but the level of tsh are borderline high so this is a situation of subclinical hypothyroidism where the thyroid hormones are uh, uh, within normal limit with a slight elevation of tsh level so this is subclinical hypothyroidism so whether to treat a child with subclinical hypothyroidism is again very important point of uh, confusion so actually uh, you have to treat a child who has got uh, subclinical hypothyroidism if there are certain uh, 
associated uh, findings like if there is uh, any evidence of autoimmunity like if the child is tpo positive thyroid peroxidase antibody positive if the child has a clinical manifestation like has a goiter and there are clinical manifestation varied the florid manifestation of hypothyroidism that is growth failure so in certain in these situation a child who is subclinically hypothyroid the treatment is warranted otherwise you just have to wait uh, wait and watch you have to reassure and you have to follow the child up and see how he behaves in future so this is how uh, you decide upon uh, treatment uh, during childhood so what happens what the difference between total uh, i've been talking about free t4 free t3 levels so what is the difference uh, normally most of the laboratories they measure the total uh, hormone uh, total means it's uh, the thyroid hormone which is bound to thyroid binding globulin predominantly and transferrin and free albumin to somewhat lesser extent so if the child who is on say a child who is on treatment you have treat, started uh, treating a child with thyroxine tablets and you have to monitor so once you have monitor after every four to six weeks so uh, because the daily uh, dosage of the drug it does have an effect on the thyroid serum thyroid hormone concentration so on the day of uh, measurement where you are going to uh, draw the sample it should be drawn before the morning dose of the drug the implications the level they can tell you about the severity of uh, thyroid dysfunction and the limitation between t4 and t3 is the because the t4 levels they are bound to thyroid binding globulin which is a protein which can be affected in a lot of conditions especially in children who are malnourished who have nephrotic syndrome so the scenario might be there might be a lot of uh, false uh, interpretation of result if we go for t4 levels so in these situation there comes a role of free uh, thyroid hormone estimation free t3 free t4 because they are devoid of this effect of thyroid binding globulin so um, what happens actually thyroid binding globulin it can be affected in uh, various uh, uh, hormonal disturbances and various other conditions like in hyperestrogenic states where like in pregnancy like if the person is on ocps so the levels of thyroid binding globulin they are high so the total t4 levels can be falsely high so they can this can lead to a misinterpretation of result and on the opposite the androgens they can cause a decrease in the tbg levels then um, so again again leading to spurious results misinterpretation of uh, results then there can be situation like aed is anti epileptic drugs as you know they are enzyme inducers so they can cause metabolism of uh, thyroid hormones then there can be drugs which can cause displacement of thyroid hormones from the receptor and the albumin as it's also a, a thyroid carrier globulin so in conditions where the level of albumin is very like in nephrotic like in chronic liver disorders so they can be false interpretation of thyroid hormone results so definitely here comes a role of free thyroid hormone estimation so it because it's divided it's uh, these uh, shortcomings are taken care of so free thyroid hormone estimation is always a preferable way of estimating wherever available but the issue with uh, the advantage as i said because it's independent of effects of uh, tbg levels and the sa is somewhat different so the issue is that uh, it's a uh, quite cumbersome and more expensive so it's not available at all places so mostly the labs they do two t4 levels and it's uh, this uh, machine that needs to be frequently calibrated so it's a difficult a cumbersome procedure so if available always go for free t4 levels and uh, uh, there is one uh, index also free t4 uh, uh index which has to be calculated which takes into account the effect of uh, tbg levels in the blood and the limitation like uh, with uh, free hormone levels in certain situations like if the child is sick there is sickness or if there is uh, if in cases of pregnancy again you can have false estimation of uh, thyroid hormone levels so that in these situation in a sick child in a pregnant uh, lady these has to be interpreted with uh, caution so um so actually summarizing the points how do you estimate thyroid function it's the thyroid hormones preferably uh, free thyroid hormone levels and tsh so these two parameters will give us most of the uh, causes of uh, not the causes the uh, dysfunction of thyroid uh, assessment so if the t4 levels are low suspect think of hypothyroidism hyperfunctioning thyroid so you then go for tsh look at tsh tsh is low or inappropriately normal think of central cause where tsh there is problem at uh, tsh uh, secretory level if the whereas if the tsh levels are high think of uh, primary hypothyroidism as the cause uh, if the free t4 levels are high think of hyperfunctioning thyroid thyrotoxicosis 
so the tsh levels should be low as a compensation so uh, think of thyrotoxicosis if the t4 levels are high with uh, low t4 tsh levels think of thyrotoxicosis whereas if the levels of tsh are also high like both t4 and tsh levels of high think of a very rare cause that is uh, tsh adenoma if the t4 levels are high as i said think of uh, t4 levels are within normal limit think of subclinical so it could be subclinical hypo or subclinical hyper So, if the TSH levels of high, think of uh, hyperfunctioning, thyrotoxicosis. If the TSH levels in the setting of T4, uh, normal T4 levels are high, think of subclinical hypothyroidism. So, this is how you interpret thyroid function in a child. So, what are the learning points? Thyroid has uh, effects on not only uh, maintaining the basal metabolic rate, but almost uh, in the smooth functioning of almost all the organs of the body in puberty, as I said, and in development. consider variations and neonatal period so always before uh, making any decision always always look at the age of the child because we have different cut off levels at different age groups think about illness non thyroidal illness always uh, try and do thyroid functions assess thyroid function in children who are uh, who are who have recovered from the illness or who are not having any illness at that time then a uh, comprehensive clinical and laboratory assessment so lab monitoring frequent monitoring is really important and need of the hour. so thank Shab you bhatta who is the uh, faculty at bp gorala institute of medical sciences dharana old kolki of mine from aims and she has been doing very good job there uh, in terms of spreading pediatrics and now we are collaborate in terms of pediatric endocrinology dr vijay jaiswal who is the head of department of pediatrics at uh, LLRM Medical College Meerut. He will be he is joining us from Meerut. Dr. Kumar unfortunately is not able to join. We will be joined by Dr. Vikas uh, Mehrotra, who will be part of the team, and he will be giving uh, the cases. And with us is Pratik again, who will start off the first case. Before that, we will just highlight why thyroid is very important. We had this 22-year-old lady whom we saw just a couple of years ago, and you can see how compromised she was in terms of height. in terms of intellectual development core skin she had hypothyroidism written all over her face but unfortunately presented at such a late stage when we had hardly by able to do anything and that really highlights the importance of neonatal screening in that regards and how clinical diagnosis may be missed in most cases and therefore there is a time for screening now once we do screening we often get confusing results and we start off with the first case for think of this 20 year old girl so a 20 year old girl came with a tss of 28 Now, what was the further plan, ma'am? So, Doctor Aisha, what would you like to do in this case? So, uh, TSH. The girl, a twenty-hour-old girl, has got a TSH of twenty-eight. Uh, uh, so, that's quite a significant number. So, I'm sure most of us would have an urge to start treatment because twenty-one, uh, twenty-eight is quite a number. But going back to the physiology slide, as I said, always look at the age of the child. So, this is a, just a twenty-hours-old baby. So, uh, she's still in. of postnatal surge so as i said ki which uh, this postnatal surge it starts at uh, um, 30 minutes of birth and persists for 72 hours so uh, i would like to repeat get the test repeated because this could be a normal uh, cut off value normal value at this age so the tsh needs to be repeated we repeated this ft4 was 1.8 and tsh was 8 what would you like to do now so actually when we once you repeated so that came out to be normal so you can go on just monitoring Child. So the big message here is that screen only after seventy-two hours. If you are in a pressure between forty to seventy-two hours, you should have the age-specific criteria. We should be used with Dr. Ayesha talked about as thirty-four being important in that perspective. Second case, Dr. Pratik, a four-day-old child came came with the TSH of twenty-two. Now, uh, uh, reports done on day fourteen was twelve. On day twenty-one, it was nine. But however, the FT four was normal all the time. Nah. So, Dr. Nisha, this is a very common case of a TSH which is persisting to be high. Started off with twenty, it's not in the real cutoffs, but it's persisting to be high at day twenty-one. What should be done in this situation, Dr. Nisha? Yeah, like here, the, the thyroid function TSH is persistently coming high, and uh, the free T4 is normal. Now, here, what we have to do is a uh, we have to do the screening. so it's most important here now in this range group where the thyroid function is 20 to 40 we normally come we have to repeat after two weeks and if it is more than 20 we obviously know we have to treat but the uh, here the problem lies when it is 
six to twenty in between range, and we have seen that tile where which has got the nine. So now, what is important is we have to do the nuclear scan. In that, uh, if you see the thyroid, it has come as a hemi agenesis. So you have to reassure the parents and start the treatment for this child. This is very important. So here, the key message is if TSH comes in between. Uh, six to twenty, even after three weeks of concern, that is more than nine. We have to need for evaluation. That is, we have to do the thyroid scan and manage accordingly if there is some problem is there. Thank you. I think that was a very very clear cut message. So don't ignore these borderline levels because they can have an outcome. And look at the cause. Don't start treatment, do a scan, and you find a cause. Next case, Dr. Pratik. A ten-day-old child came with a very high TSH of hundred. The FT4 is 11, and the scan showed absolutely no thyroid tissue. So, what would be the further plan, sir? So, this child, Dr. Vijay, was referred to us as thyroid agenesis. Now, how do you go forward in this regard, Dr. Vijay? Yes. Uh, good afternoon. Yes. Hello. Are you getting me? Yeah. Yes. Yes. So again, so TSH is very high and this is a 10 year old boy and we have to see whether the child is actually not having thyroid gland or something else. So we have to prepare for that, that how to uh, do the uh, ultroxin. So the thing is that only ultroxin, that is L-thyroxin is the treatment of choice. There is no need, even we know that T3 is the most active part, but T4 is to be given and branded tablet to be given because we this is a very vital important thing. Now coming to the branded tablet, thyroxine that is L-troxine to be given and the dose is very important that what should be the dose. So in a 10, if so depending upon the age, 10 to 15 microgram per kg per day will be the dose that what we have to do. So what we do the timing? Timing usually you say that empty stomach in case of if the newborn is there then four hours after feed but what will be the feasible at least some gap has to be given uh, during uh, this uh, recommendation of thyroid hormone. Now and on, how to do, yes. Yeah, so on follow up yes, the dose was very high the dose had to be reduced but still his feed for remained high and we were able to take him off the treatment. Now parents have been counseled this is a permanent cause. Why do you think his thyroid requirement has come off now? Yes, yes, yes. So one more thing is important that uh, just commencement of the treatment, if TSS set point is very high, we don't expect that TSS was in a lieu of more than 100. So we don't chase only the TSS because this TSS uh, is going to come down even with adequate replacement, it is going to be to take a long time. So here, we have to monitor the child on the basis of FT4, that is free T4 level. If it is the, in a higher upper normal range, then it's, it is okay. Okay. So now, Dr. Vijay, uh, this case has been diagnosed as an absent thyroid because of the nucleus scan. But the key message again yes. here is that if they all absent uh, thyroid do not make thyroid dysgenesis. And as you said, we should do it as it is also very important. So what do you think is the role of ultrasound in this situation? Yes, ultrasound is very important because there can be some conditions where nuclear scan due to maybe antibodies related. So that uptake is not going to be there, but in the ultrasound, you are going to pick the thyroid tissue. So on the ultrasound in this child, ultrasound utopic thyroid was there. Then again, we have to search for that why there was not uptake. Uh, so there, there can be causes that can be mother was hypothyroidism and whether is screen for antibodies. So, so I would like to see whether the mother was having antithyroid antibodies. Yeah, so mother had autoimmune hypothyroidism and her TPO was positive. We did not do a TRAB antibody. But given the oral yes. of an absent gland and a thing which is resolving, it fits into the maternal DSH receptor blocking antibody which have gone off with time. I think that's what, and the key message that you gave, Dr. Vijay, I think very clearly you said that if the uptake is absent, it is not a genesis. Ultrasound is very, yes. very important. This is something which is very, very crucial. And uh, next case, Dr. Pratik. 
A four-day-old child came with a high PSH of more than 100 and was diagnosed as dyskinesogenesis. Now, so starting on LT4 at 50. Now, on four weeks, the PSH came down to 24. However, the LT4 was 21. So, uh, what would be the further plan, sir? So, Dr. Uh, Vikas, this child he has a high TSH and a slightly high normal FT4. Would you like to increase the dose in this setting, Dr. Vikas? Uh, thank you, Dr. Vasudev. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vasudev. Am I available now? Yeah, yeah. Please so, go ahead. Please go ahead. Uh, so, uh, so if it is the child F4. I think your voice is uh, breaking, Dr. Vikas. So I think what we are seeing in this case, Pratik, is that this child we are following, as Dr. Vijay had said, that we have to monitor the FT4 and PSH may take a long time because his PSH actually has been reset right from pregnancy. Hello. Hello. Yeah, Dr. Vikas. Hello. So your voice is breaking. Okay. Okay. Uh, Am I available now? Yeah, please go ahead. Please go ahead. So we have discussed that in this case the PSH is persistently uh, high. This looks like a recent access. Okay. Okay. Now. So, uh, so what is ha happening in this case is PSH is persistently high despite having uh, uh, adequate treatment, and FT4 is high. Uh, so this uh, reset of hypothalamic pituitary thyroid axis will take some time. So in case in a setting where the PSH is very high, it will take some time to normalize axis. We will not like to repeat that uh, increase the dose for some time. But what is important is. So this basically means that we need to continue the same dose. Then on follow up, what happened? Pradeep? There was a delay on that three years away. They could notice that this child had delayed speech. And further, what would be done? So now we have a case of dysomorphogenesis, and what we see that he has uh, now a delayed speech at three years. I think this is a very important clue that everybody who comes to us with hypothyroidism should actually be evaluated for other things as well. So best would be to do a. Uh, Uh, X-ray to look at whether the, there was a fetal hypothyroidism, to get hearing because many of them may actually have a hearing abnormality or may be associated with Pendet syndrome in which there could be a hearing abnormality and finally development. So in this case, I think it's very clear that there is a hearing issue with hypothyroidism with this homologous so this is Pendet syndrome. So the messages of this case are that it may take time for the HPT axis to resolve. Initial titration in the first six month one year is FT4. In the high normal range and very normal height. Next case, uh, Dr. Pradeep. So, a 12-year-old girl came with obesity. Her height was 156 centimeters, and she was 56 kg. However, she had no other clinical features. The PSH was slightly raised at 6.4, and for which she was actually advised treatment. Now, what would be the further plan? So, Dr. Aisha, would you treat this girl? We have a 12-year-old uh, girl. Uh, who is obese? So again, this is a very frequently observed condition. So we have uh, obesity. So we have to find out where its obesity is the cause or the effect with of hypothyroidism. So going back to the physiology again, as we had seen in obese children, what happens actually the levels of leptin they increase and it causes stimulation of TSH. So the TSH is the effect of obesity and not the cause. So if the levels are more than ten, then only you have to think. In between six to ten, you have to think that the uh, increase in the level of PSH is because of obesity, and it's not the cause of obesity. It's not caused by hypothyroidism. So I would like to uh, just uh, reassure the parents. Okay, so as you have wonderfully told us that if the PSH is between six to ten, uh, unless there is TPO positivity or goiter, we should not start treatment. So this is the most common referral which we get from pediatricians. Borderline high TSH in obesity. It is the effect of obesity and not the cause of obesity. Do not be unnecessary in this regard. The key messages are that in the high TSH, the effect is not cause of obesity. No treatment if it's below ten. Now the next case: ten-year-old girl with poor concentration, sir. So ten-year-old girl has come with history of poor concentration. Her height is about thirty-six centimeters. She's thirty-four kg. She turned as youth thyroid. However, then the TSH report showed that it was two point two, and the T four was slightly low. At 60. So, so now, what, yes. So now, what would be the plan, Dr. Nisha? Do you think that this child has a central hypothyroidism? Uh, the most important in this is uh, 
is here we have done what we have done is a T4. Now, so most important here is to get a, further is a free T4. That will be the very important to get in this and also uh, the TPO. If it is negative, here once we have done T4, it has come out to be free T4 has come out to be the normal. And uh, here, so this child TPO is also negative. So child does not need any treatment. So here, what is very important is thyroid function. You should not just rely on the T4. You should have a free T4. As Dr. Ayesa has previously said, so it's very important. There are certain conditions where T4 is low because it's a thyroid binding globulin. There can be the regions where it can be low. So we need to have a free T4 to confirm whether this T4 value is really low or it is arbitrarily low. So on that basis only, we can decide. Thank you. I think that this is a very big message. Please do FT4 and TSH. T3, FT3 are a waste of money unless you're thinking of thyrotoxicosis. T4 is uh, unreliable in many conditions. So FT4, TSH is the first investigation to do. Again, this case highlights this again. 12 year old girl. Now, here we have a 12 year old girl who complains of lethargy. She is 140 centimeters and 36 kgs. Here we see that the FT4 is low at 6 and the TSH is not raised, so it is just 12. So now we would like to see, of course, this child was outside practitioner started on thyroxine looking at this and not, nothing else was done for this child. So what would be the further plan? So Dr. Vijay, do you think that this child should have been started with thyroxine immediately? No, first we have to see that um, this scenario is quite typical and thank you for uh, discussing this case because it is an important that we don't have to see only TSS, high TSS and low FT4. Rather, second thing is that we have to see with this level of free T4 whether TSS is appropriately high or it has to be much more. So, of course, it has to be much more. So, before just jumping onto the treatment part, we have to assess again for the patient that what is the value of FT4, what is the value of TSS and what is the now what can be the probable condition of the patient. Now coming to the FT4, which is low, but here we can see that TSH is below 20. So we have to be very cautious regarding treatment of a patient who is having low FT4 and TSH inappropriately high, inappropriately low. It means that, so that you are leaving the patient of central hypothyroidism. And this, and this Later on, diagnosed that we have done the cortisol level, which was low. MRI showed empty cella. So it is mandatory that if TSS is not appropriately high in lieu of FT4, we have to do the uh, this uh, pituitary function. And this is because unless and until if you are going to directly start thyroxine, then probably this patient might win into the shock because of cortisol deficiency. So the key message is that in case of low free T4 and TSS less than 20, though this is not a very common, but central hypothyroidism should be suspected along with, uh, uh, so we have to do this imaging as well as cortisol function. So it is mandatory to do this. But this is a very, very important thing. Do not rush with thyroxine because this patient came to us with shock. Look at TSH and then go ahead. Now, next case, Dr. Prateek. A 12 year old girl who presented with growth failure, and now she has a very high TSH of more than 100. Free T4 is low. So, what would be the further plan? How would we treat this child? So, Dr. Vikas, how would you treat this girl? See, uh, Dr. Vashpay, this girl has got very high TSH and with a definitely low, F, uh, low rather FT4. So, we have to start the treatment. So, can we have treatment protocol, please? Yeah, it's coming. Okay. So this is thing which is very, very important in this case is, see, she is a 12 year old girl child with TSH. So we have to assess the child in total. We have to do the pivotal assessment. We have to do the bone age because this child has got growth failure also. And if we start the treatment, she might have catch up growth. So we might require some GNI support also. 
So assessment of puberty and assessment of bone age is that should be the integral part of this case. And you see, if you see the dose, those are as per the ages. And if your child has got an OB, then you can calculate the dose by surface area. Always remember, try to build up the dose very early, gradually, because this child has might be having a speed up growth and, and that she might not have to have, attend the final height. Dose should not be divided into two doses. It should be given a single, a single dose. There should not be any intermingle with other medicine like uh, supplements, iron or calcium. And uh, and you should always use branded tablet as Dr. Vijay has uh, categorically said. And only supplement is levothyroxine. No role of TSH or T3. Yeah. And let's see how the child behaves after treatment. So after starting treatment after one year, you know that the TSH is so at one year, the TSH is this is a very typical uh, thing. It was very poor in the very typical situation. TSH is uh, high. The FP4 okay. was 20. This is a very typical situation. This is a very typical situation. TSH is high, and FT4 is higher side of normal. So uh, this might be a situation that before coming to the sampling to the lab or before coming to the OPD, the child has started taking tablet for last three four days because FT4 will not take much time to become normalized. But TSH is you see high TSH, high TSH means the child was not taking adherence was poor and she has taken that tablet recently so that we can have got high T4 level but TSH is still high so we have to look, take care of adherence, adherence to a treatment and compliance of the child. Yeah, I think that's a very very this important. Yeah, so if your TSH is high and FT4 is also high, think of adherence. If TSH is high and FT4 is low at normal increased dose, if TSH is low, you have to reduce those in that case. So I think this is a very, very interesting finding that Dr. Vikas has mentioned in this case. So the key messages are gradual replacement, appropriate timing, adherence become important in monitoring. Next case, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Well, day old child came with irritability. Uh, the birth rate was 2800, which had reduced to 2200 grams. Uh, there was tachycardia, there was also the proctosis. And on, on evaluation, we found that the TSS was suppressed and the FT4 was raised to 44. So now, on this was not known before and further probing, we found out that the mother had grazed and undergone ablation two years back. So now, what, how would we uh, go ahead with this? This is very important here. We have seen that there is a weight loss. Child has a baby has a tachycardia and proptosis. And when we have seen the thyroid function, is a free T4 is very high. So there is a thyrotoxicosis. Though the mother had a grapes and hit it for two years ago, it's very known that uh, the thyroid blinding albumin can cross the placenta and can lead the grapes disease in 1% of the children. So this is very uh, important. It, uh, it has to be there. So if the child has a problem, like this child has a tachycardia, this child had a proptosis, and they can have a several other problems. So they need to be treated with a uh, uh, thy suppressant, either methamazole or uh, propyl thyroursin. But most important is methamazole. This is there. And it's very important that we start beta blocker up to there. And we should always remember this is a transient condition and should be uh, looked for and carefully follow up because once the thyroid globulin will start disappearing, then there will not be much problem. So the need for the evaluation is very important. So very important here is a very key because half life of thyroglobulin is almost two weeks and it can even persist for six to four weeks. So very important here is a key message. Whenever the baby has a tremor, weight loss with the eye signs of grape disease and thyrotoxicosis is very important. You should start with the methamazole and this. Uh, give a beta blocker and should take further if not possible if not we can even sometimes look for the RAI for the treatment it's very important that is there if it is not controlled then RAI can also be given for a shorter period of time uh, so with the grapes disease earlier in the mother also we should look for this problem Thank I you. think that's a big message that even if mother had had a radio surgery or a radioactive iodine, the baby is still at risk because the antibodies are crossing. So maybe three years after radioactive iodine and five years after surgery, you have to be very, very cautious for this thing. Now, next case, Dr. Prithik. 
Dr. Ankit, the, the age limit is not based upon age, but it's more of a bone age dependent. If your bone age is very, very advanced, then maybe probably you're not going to benefit, but otherwise you can think of it. In BMI chart, under what level is under nutrition? So there are different criteria which are available in the BMI chart. There are SDS you can use and you can use based upon that. Dr. Shipra is asking, can we just ask for X-ray hand in all ages for bone age or do we need other X-rays too? You pretty much ask for the left wrist and hand, that's pretty relevant. Shoulder X-ray is not very, very important in that regard. How is priming done before growth hormone stimulation? Dr. Sawmill is asking again the growth question because there is a lag, that's why we are taking these questions. So priming is done with the help of estrogen in girls for two days. You give ethyl estradiol or you can give a dose of uh, estradiol valerate or you give one week prior to the testing you can do the injection testosterone. Dr. Dr. Pankaj Kardeja is asking your bone age application is validated. How it is validated as this is shown by Dr. Uh, Riddhi that we have already validated it in a large number of X-rays compared to bone expert as well as the manual TW3. So this is, uh, we are actually sending it for publication as well. The paper is on publication. Now, Dr. Rishikesh is asking about plotting plus minus six centimeters, how to plot curve. So it's an approximate curve that we draw back, we draw up and down. And what we usually will recommend that you can go for corrected height is this, which is much better. Dr. Srinivas is asking about blood to urine carbon dioxide difference in RTA. This will come up and we discuss about RTA a bit. Uh, Dr. Lalit Arora is asking about how to measure metacarpal shortening. So the easy way out is that you ask them to clinch the fist and put a scale between the various fingers. If there is a dip, it means that there is a difference there. Dr. Ria is asking what is the growth velocity chart you use in. There are now Indian data available for the growth velocity chart, so it should be specific. We have got Dr. Raman's criteria, which is there. Now we come back to the thyroid questions. Dr. Virendra is asking, will TBG affect FT4 levels in neonate? FT4 levels in neonates are really a, a debatable issue because unless you're using an equilibrium dialysis, they may be variable. So I think that's something which we need to be a bit cautious in that regards. But yes, it can be affected by a number of factors, but not by TBG per se. Now, Dr. Pankaj is also asking how to take medication instructions for family. So this basically, we always say that for a congenital hypothyroidism, you crush between the two spoons, dissolve in the breast milk and give. In that regard, so for adults, for older children, we want them to take in the empty stomach, 45 minutes gap between the tablets and the meal, six hour gap between the calcium as well. Now, Dr. Nick here, Dr. Pankaj is also asking, uh, Mother is hypothyroid on medications controlled and what about baby does human need to be do lab tests at birth? Whether the mother is hypothyroid, hyperthyroid, youth thyroid, you have to do a thyroid function at birth. That's extremely important. Everybody should have a screening done. Now, Dr. Rajan is asking if we start inotropes in newborns, how many days can we send PFTR stopping inotropes? Very good question. Dopamine can decrease TSH levels. So you can do a baseline screen. If your TSH is high, it is significant. If it is normal, do it after three weeks. That's what we basically recommend. Dr. Tanuja is asking relationship between fetal and maternal thyroid axis. So, of course, the TRH can cross the placenta. The TSH cannot. Around 30% of free T4 can cross from the mother. So, fetus pretty much grows by itself in terms of the overall regulation. Now, in terms of malnourished children and SGA babies, there is not much difference in terms of thyroid functions unless they are sick in that regards. Dr. Hemant is asking about, can we ask for FT4 and TSH when available directly? Yes, that will be the ideal test in that regards. Dr. Mitsu is asking about a 30-year-old female primary diagnosis hypothyroid at 6 weeks of gestation, TSH of 21, and T4.82 at 20 weeks, TSH is 0.138. What are the chances of fetal being affected? That's a very, very important question. The effect of subclinical hypothyroidism in the first trimester of pregnancy is a major issue of debate. However, most studies suggest that if the treatment is started at the right time, we do not expect a huge impact, maybe just a couple of IQ points. So I would always encourage that please do not go ahead with many people talk about termination, particularly the gynecologist in this stage. But at six weeks, if you are able to come back at 10 weeks to a normal TSH, I think it's going to have a no effect on outcome in most studies which have shown. Now, goiter with new thyroidism, basically we will look at whether it's a multinodular goiter or a solitary goiter, do a TPO level if required, do a thyroid function if everything is normal, wait and watch is what should be done. Dr. Yankappa is asking the duration of treatment for subclinical hypothyroidism. 
the duration of treatment basically when you're treating for somebody who has a TPO positivity is usually lifelong, but you start with the lowest dose and then you monitor TSH and that will give you the clue. Now, condition where weight increases in thyrotoxicosis, I would say treatment, if you treat thyrotoxicosis, the weight will increase, otherwise thyrotoxicosis should cause weight loss. And that's pretty much evident. Which time of the day we check thyroid function test? Dr. Ayesha, I think, has very clearly mentioned that there is not much of an issue. TSH can be done any time of the day. FT4 should be done before taking the tablets. Dr. G. Hari Kumar is asking what is the clinical significance of TPO and TRAP? TPO antibody, the only indication I'll suggest is if your TSH is between 6 and 10. So if you are in doubt, then you do TPO. If you have goiter, you do TPO. Otherwise, no role of TPO. TRAB is a TSH receptor antibody. You can think of distinguishing between a Graves disease versus a thyroiditis. You can do a TRAB level. But this level would basically uh, not require in everybody. So Dr. G. Hari Kumar again from Podium is asking the same TPO and TRH. How to monitor a child with MPHT? Now that's a big issue. It's an entire topic. We have got a four-hour session on MPHT in our module, which is there. But just to summarize, look at FT4. Very, very important. FT4 will be very important. Dr. Manar from Egypt is asking about thyroglossal cysts. Surgical removal could cause hypothyroidism. Yes, it can, but the chances of malignancy are very high in a thyroglossal cyst. So we have to remove a thyroglossal cyst in that regard. Dr. Vikrant is asking, how do we proceed in sick youth thyroid? So you sick youth thyroid, you repeat the levels after three to six weeks. But if your TSH is high, if you have a sick child with high TSH, that is not sick youth thyroid. There is something wrong because sickness will cause decrease in TSH level. Dr. Lokraj is asking about validity of TSH in sick newborns. Again, low levels are not significant. High levels are significant. Dr. Shipra Chaudhary is asking about indication in doing DPO, which we have discussed. Dr. Preeti Jain is asking, what if some baby in this few targets of eltroxin? Very, very important. Uh, I think we have seen patients who have, if they take a lot of targets, maybe 20, 25, they start having problems of tachycardia, admit them for a couple of days. If they have taken that much, look at ECG changes and that will improve. Dr. Guru Prasad is asking what TSH cut off at different ages. So generally speaking, we are talking about uh, more than 40 in the first week, 20 between the first couple of weeks, 6 after that, and pretty much childhood 6 is the figure we are talking about. Treatment figures are of course higher at 10. And then Tarora from Kanpo is asking duration of treatment in goiterous thyroiditis. Usually it will be lifelong. If most cases are now, we know it's autoimmune, so they will require long-term treatment. Dr. Lograj is talking about risk of cranial sutures in osteosis in newborn under thyroxin. Good question. We have seen that, but it only happens if you are over treating a lot in that regard. So I think that will be the situation probably we will be thinking of that. And then Dr. Rakhi Chan is asking about a two month old neonate being treated for acute liver failure. Got tested for TFT for first time. TSH is 15, but T4 is normal. Should the test be repeated? Straight away. I think this is a very tricky situation. I would hold on. <laughs>